so we're, welcome to the VLS Open House uh, for uh, May 3rd uh, or May 4th today, I'm sorry. Uh, today's session or this session is on creating OER. Uh, my name is Don Eldridge and I am a digital learning associate with eCampus Ontario on the programs and services team and I'll be moderating today's session. I uh, just want to offer a land acknowledgement as we begin our session here today. eCampus Ontario's offices in downtown Toronto are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, and the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I join you today from Fort Francis, Ontario which is situated in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the first peoples of this land. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places. This is one of the things that makes the online environment special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in our chat, and you may use the uh, link that's being dropped in the chat now as well. In addition uh, to our land acknowledgement, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities for their investment in the virtual learning strategy. The VLS drives growth and advancement in virtual learning across the province's post-secondary institutions. Uh, we will also be dropping the link in the, uh, for, to the VLS in the chat if you'd like to learn more. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to stop uh, sharing, and I invite our presenters uh, to for our first presentation today, which is on High Flex Open Textbook Collaboration. It's a panel chat, um, so we'd like to invite our presenters to come forward. Uh, that's uh, Jenny Heyman, who will be moderating today's session, and the panelists, uh, Joseph Beer, uh, Krista Cesaloni, Kathleen Clark, Nicole Damachuk, Sydney Shapiro, and Mel Young. I invite them to come forward and to share their screen and take us through their presentation at this time. Hi, great. Hi, Don. It's Jenny Heyman uh, here. Uh, for some reason, we can't seem to turn on our videos <laughs> as, as a group of panelists. So if oh, that could happen, uh, that'll be that'll be super great. <laughs> okay. Perhaps if one of our uh, kind of uh, backroom staff there could assist with that, if, is that possible? But I can get us started, uh, and you can look at me as, as a you know frozen bubble of frost. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that, uh, for the land acknowledgement and for the welcome, Don. Uh, it's really great to see everyone today. So we are here as uh, as a panel, a group of folks, to talk about our development of the High Flex uh, Teaching and Learning Strategies press book as part of our eCampus e Ontario funding uh, this past year. And we're really excited to talk about the project, to introduce ourselves. Oh, there we go. Hey, there's video. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, and I'm here to moderate the panel and uh, we'll invite them to introduce themselves as well. Once the introductions have happened, I'll give everyone just a quick tour of the of the press book that we created uh, and put I'll make sure I put the link into our chat. Uh, but it's really great to see everyone. It's really exciting to hear about all of the all of the eCampus Ontario uh, projects. Uh, and to finally see some of the things released and be able to look them up and go searching, which is really fun. So um, I'll start with you, uh, Joe Beer. Uh, if you'd introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your institution and your role in this project, that'd be great. Thanks, Jenny. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Joe Beer. I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral people. Uh, I'm the Director of Teaching Learning Development at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, my main role in this project was more as an advisor to support Kathleen, because most of my experience is in the supporting of faculty trying to use some of these hybrid high flex initiatives. So I was supporting Kathleen based on that experience. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. Kathleen, maybe it makes sense to go to you next. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Clark. I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Laurier. My role on the project was developing the content on module four, 
which was about evaluating the effectiveness of high flex teaching. Great, thanks Kathleen. Uh, Krista, how about you? you? Yes, hello, my name is Krista Ciccolini. Um, I'm from Cambrian College and my role on the project was lead instructional designer. Um, so my job was to take everything that everyone gave me and put it into a press book and make it look nice, <laughs> which was no small feat, but it was a very great learning experience. Great, thanks Krista. Mel Young, how about you? Hi everyone, my name is Mel Young. I am an educational developer and professor at Cambrian College uh, and I'm in the Teaching and Learning Innovation Hub. Um, my role in the project was um, to support the development of the of the e-text, but also uh, co-writing co uh, module one and module three. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sydney Shapiro. I'm gonna go with you next. Uh, I'm Sidney Shapiro. I'm a program coordinator and professor in the business analytics program. And on the project, I co-wrote a bunch of the text and put together the video parts, which took a lot more editing than I could have ever imagined. Great. Thanks so much, Sid. And Nicole Demanchuk. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm joining you today from Lambton College, uh, which is located on the traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa First Nations. And those three individual nations make up the traditional um, Three Fires Confederacy. So it's my pleasure to be joining you from here today. Uh, I am the director of our teaching and learning commons at Lambton College. And my role in this project was working with a fantastic colleague of mine, Angela Barclay, who can't be here today to um, draft up um, and work with her, supporting her on content creation for module two in um, the press book about uh, content planning and lesson planning. Great, thanks so much, Nicole. Uh, and I'm Jenny Heyman. I am uh, Dean of Academic Excellence and Innovation at Cambrian College. I was the lead project coordinator for this project um, and deeply appreciate the partnership that we had from both Lampton and Laurier on this project uh, and internally uh, at Cambrian as well. It was a really exciting project to work on. Uh, I'm gonna check and see if I'm able to share my screen, which it looks like I can. So I just want to kind of walk you through just a little bit about the book itself. Uh, and maybe I might ask Mel if you can put the link to the textbook in the chat while I'm having while I'm walking through a little. Uh, so this is a, uh, an openly licensed press book um, with multiple authors. Uh, super exciting. We chose the Creative Commons attribution non-commercial share alike. So, so everything except non-derivative. So you can download, use, share, uh, change, remix, uh, all those great things as long as you don't sell it and that you share it out uh, in the same way that it was created. So if I scroll down, and I don't know, I, I've, I have gotten used to Pressbooks navigation a bit and it's changed a bit. So if I scroll down on any front page of a Pressbook now, uh, I get to see the contents, uh, which is great. So this, this book was essentially designed and the money from eCampus was to design four modules of learning. Our principal audience for this is um, post-secondary educators who are interested in learning more about high flex teaching. Uh, but this applies to hybrid teaching, flex teaching, uh, multimodal teaching, however you wanna frame that, uh, which is a super hot topic. I can tell by the number of folks who are with us today. So that's great. Uh, we're really excited and proud of the work that we were able to do. Uh, so the first module is course planning. The second module is lesson planning. So getting down to a little bit more micro content design. Module three is engaging multimodal students in high flex courses uh, and student engagement, as many of you will have experienced these past two and a half years, uh, is uh, a real challenge in any virtual learning environment. Uh, and then evaluating the effectiveness of high flex teaching, um, which um, Sidney Shapiro has certainly engaged uh, very fully in prior to the pandemic when he was teaching in three different modes and really doing some great experimentation. So there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience that has gone into these chapters, uh, and we hope that it's a useful resource for folks. So I'll stop sharing. You can all check out this resource uh, on your own, among the many other amazing resources uh, that have come to us as part of VLS grants. 
Um, so I had a series of questions for the panelists, and I might start with you again, Joe. So what elements uh, of the textbook were most interesting for you to, to be part of or to learn about? Uh, it's a really good question. I mean, um, for me, the, the whole area of high flex is, is uh, it seems to be everyone's favorite thing at the moment with very little information about what that means. And so the, the thing that interested me most is the space itself uh, it, it is so vacuous, but also so important. So uh, having the opportunity to begin some of these conversations so we can hopefully put a foundation down to start having some more informed engagements at a institutional level with how we how, how we start moving into some of these more hybrid and high flex approaches to teaching and learning. I mean, it definitely seems to be what we want our future to look like, uh, but I think we have to do it in an informed way. So, uh, you know, the thing that interested me most about the project was starting to do some actual work to start thinking about what this looks like for faculty in the cold face of doing that teaching. Great, thanks, Joe. Uh, Kathleen, how about you? What was most, most interesting for you about pull, pulling the project together? Um, so I mentioned that I was responsible for module four, the evaluating the effectiveness. And for me, the interesting part of that was initially carving out what does it mean to evaluate something and how do we determine what effectiveness means? So I went down a bit of a rabbit hole trying you know, to understand the literature just about that. And regardless of modality, what do these terms mean? Um, and then kind of borrowing from online learning face-to-face -face and applying some of that to the high flex context. It was kind of just an Im ambiguous um, topic and then trying to put that in a way that people would kind of understand, here's what we mean by evaluation and effectiveness, I found super interesting. And I think this is a really good starting point for moving the conversation forward about how we can do that. Great, thanks Kathleen. Uh, Krista, how about you? What was most interesting for you? Uh, so for me, it, the, the most interesting part was learning the Pressbook technology. It was the first time I had ever created a Pressbook. Um, and while I had some experience in WordPress, which is like the back end technology of Pressbook, it wasn't something I was super, um, I, I had super in depth experience with. So um, that learning experience was, was really, really great. Um, I loved the ability of kind of marrying a bunch of different skills and knowledge sets that I had into one project. So, um, you know, my knowledge of teaching and writing and tech and H5P and all of these elements were, were um, brought into this textbook. So it was, I kind of had a love hate relationship with this project because it was such a, it was a beast of a project. It was huge. Um, and we knew that it was going to be a topic that was very um, popular and very in demand. And so the pressure to make something um, very uh, cohesive and something that was digestible was something that wasn't it, it wasn't lost on me that that was the intent. Um, so the most interesting part was taking this this huge topic, hugely popular topic, something that's relatively new, uh, taking all of the wonderful information from um, from everyone um, and kind of creating it into this cohesive uh, cohesive space. So um, it was it was amazing. I learned so much not only about high flex but also about about technology. Great, thanks, Krista. And and having kind of been privy to your process, I can say that uh, it was heroic work. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, we're deeply grateful for all the work that, you know, the sweat and the tears poured into it uh, uh, yes. as part of the group. Uh, Mel, how about you? What was the most interesting part for you? Well, when I was brought into the project, I was like, oh, high flex. I honestly, I, as, a, as an educator, I was like, I don't see how this can work. I was imagining like a completely asynchronous course and then a synchronous delivery and creating these two completely separate learning experiences. But my favorite part was doing the research. When I did the research and I reached out, I was talking to people who were doing, who had been doing this for quite a while. Um, I was seeing how they were able to create synergies between their asynchronous and their synchronous deliveries so that it's not like you're creating two different delivery modes. I think that's what scares most people. And that's not what you're doing. Um, you have to be intentional about weaving together um, the student experience in all of those modes, which can be challenging, but it makes it a much richer learning experience for students. So that was my favorite part was before 
I was a non-believer and now I can, now I can actually see how it works. <laughs> Great. Well, that's, that's good. That's one converted. Excellent. Um, Nicole, how about you? What was your favorite part of the project? Yeah, I think I can. Um, there are some parallels there with what some other folks have already said. And Krista, the fact that you were learning Pressbooks through this was not at all evident or obvious. You demonstrated such fantastic skill. Um, yeah, we felt like we were in wonderful hands through the whole project. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, what was so interesting is that as we as we started down this path as well, it was trying to wrap our heads around like, what would this really look and feel like in a classroom? And as educators who um, both Angela and myself really um, thrive in an active learning type of um, environment in the classroom with lots of interaction and engagement with our students, thinking, how are we gonna make that happen? If we've got students who are asynchronous and also synchronous remote and in front of us in a shared space. And so because we were working on the section about lesson planning and content delivery, that really gave us the opportunity to kind of dive in and look at all the other fantastic resources that many folks out there have made public and available to help to support this type of work, to figure out how you know, certain activities could be modified just a little if there was intention on the front end to allow them to be really successful across these three modes um, with, as Mel just described, not creating three times the activities or three separate paths, that there really are ways to weave everyone together. Um, and the benefits of the flexibility and the access uh, and the support for students to be able to have multiple ways to go about their learning, depending on where they are, what their needs are, what different things they're juggling, just to me has so much promise um, that being able to, to work on this and start to think of what would the learning environment really look like for folks um, was, was very, very interesting. Um, and it was also such a privilege to be able to be working with this group of people um, who had so much shared expertise and openness to collaborate and, um, you know, connect quickly to just kind of bounce ideas off of one another. It was a really great experience. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Sydney, I'm going to go to you. We're just asking what, um, what was the most interesting part of this process for you? And I see a couple of questions, Sydney, that might actually fall into your area of expertise, but we'll start with, you know, what was most interesting for you? Well, I'll tell you the real answer. I'll tell you the truth that nobody else is going to tell you today. People have a lot of feelings about this topic, a lot. When we first started looking at who's out there, who's using this, 90% of it is driven by a pandemic. People say, I do not want to shift into something new. I hate this idea. They're forcing me to use things. It's terrible. It's going to create more time and so on. I've been teaching with HyFlex for five years. And the problem is that if you said to me, what is it? How do you do it? What's it involved? I have an answer that works in my context, which is quite different than most other people. For me, the coolest part of the project and the thing that was really neat is I got to talk to the person, Brian Beatty, who made this up. And that's like interviewing Alexander Graham Bell about what's it like to make the first phone call. And he, he talked about the culture shift that happened at his organization 20 years ago, which eventually not only became standard practice in his courses, but got adopted by his university. And it was a regular thing. It wasn't suddenly driven this massive pivot where everybody is Googling this thing all at the same time. And his like email, he said he went from like one email a year to 50,000 emails a day because suddenly everybody in every institution said, how do we implement this? How do we make it better? How do we change it? What are other possibilities? For me, the biggest takeaway and the bottom line with everything that we're going to talk about is that if you don't have access, it's an issue of equity. You're not able to come to class. You have other things going on in your life. It's recorded. Watch the video. Everybody has the same access. They have the same ability to participate in the course. And you're never missing out by the fact that you can't participate a different way, which means that education becomes more equitable and people are able to participate. So I think it's really about empowering students in a way that just redefines how we're teaching classes, how we're grading papers and how we're putting all that together in a way, again, that makes it easier for faculty and helps students. Um, I'm just maybe going to go to a question, Sid, because we're talking. Um, someone's asking, how do you manage the synchronous 
in person simultaneously. I think that's the crux of the matter for so many educators right now. If I have students in person in front of me and I have some virtual students through Zoom or whatever channel we have them, how am I making sure that, you know, to the best of my ability as, a, as an educator that they're, they're both looked after? Was that a question for me? Yeah. Ah, Just because you have the most experience with it, I would say, say pre-pandemic, but way back when, when you had three I modes wear, of teaching. <laughs> I wear very strong glasses, which means I can't see the back of the classroom right. while I'm walking around talking and fixing people's problems. Yeah. If you message me on the Zoom chat, I'll, there's no way I'll ever be able to see it. Yeah. So really, it's about enabling the classroom. Let's work on this together. Why doesn't somebody tell me if somebody sends a message, then we'll bring it up or just start talking and we'll do that too. So it's basically not me controlling every aspect of the class delivering the, it's everybody collaboratively working together so we're able to see what's going on. So that's number one, most important. I also use a lot of students in the class. So there's content that's gonna be on the screen. In addition to me walking around and talking to people and so on, that content can be driven by one of the students. So for example, I teach coding classes, a student will be sharing their screen so everybody can see it or I'll be sharing it and I'll be helping people in other words, it's like scaffolding the professor and TA version, but there's 20 TAs and everybody's helping everybody else in order to make sure that we're on the same page and moving forward effectively. Great, thanks, Sid. That's really very helpful. Uh, someone wanted to know how many hours it took to do the entire project. <laughs> I'd have to kind of add that up and consult the, you know, what, what we landed with with eCampus Ontario, but I would say it was around 200 or 250 hours per person working on the project uh, and probably many more hours than that, right? We, we often submit our grants and we say, this is, this is our estimate uh, about where we land. Um, but when it comes down to really pulling things together and creating the highest possible quality, uh, we probably end up with many more hours than that. Um, so it ends up being, you know, a fairly a strong labor of love for very busy folks uh, in their roles. Um, but that's kind of where we landed there. Yeah, hundreds. <laughs> it's actually true. If you And we have one more person as part of the project. Uh, we had a student, a person, Japsamar Singh, who started out with us. Uh, he was one of SID students uh, and he worked on the project and was such a good person to have on board to give us that student perspective. He really brought that to, uh, to our project and we think that it's really so important. Um, I see we have about six minutes or so and I just wanna check and make sure that we can you know, ask a, a few more questions. I'm gonna check the actual QA and see what we've got there. Uh, how have you found implications for administrators or senior management in implementing HyFlex? Uh, things they may, may, may need to be aware of separate from the interests of faculty and students. Uh, that's, uh, that's a really great question. Um, I might ask you, Nicole, because I think you're trying to kind of roll this out at your institution. And what are you seeing, you know, for, kind of from an administrator perspective is important to know about HyFlex? Yeah, so that is a good question. Um, I think it it is valuable to be sure that you, as an institution, have a shared understanding about what you mean at your institution for high flex. So um, there are there are different interpretations of what that word means, and different institutions may have different targets in mind or starting points. Um, in mind or technologies available to support various approaches. So I think that would be that would be my key recommendation there is that it'd be important for everyone to be kind of on the same page with what do we mean when we're talking about this and what is it that we're anticipating this will look like. Uh, and Kathleen, I might ask you, you know, from a faculty perspective, what type of support from administrators would you be looking for when when trying to I guess, come new to this practice of high flex teaching? Um, I would be looking for kind of using this book as a starting point, but then actually having additional supports and getting into the classroom as a group and working through it in workshop format type thing. Um, because this is a great starting point for learning about high flex and how to do it. But it's really when you get into the classroom and try to do this that you learn a lot of small intricacies about how to manage the classroom. So additional support around kind of building a community on campus that is invested in this to do it well. Um, and then also kind of support 
in having people in the classroom who are able to help with um, like the chat um, and just navigating the tech and things like that. It's very difficult as one person cognitively to navigate everything. So any additional supports inside the classroom will certainly help with that. Great, and I see folks have been answering in the chat as well, which I appreciate. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm going to do one more lightning round and just ask uh, the panel, what do you hope that folks will actually get from this resource? I'll start with you, Joe. Well, well I think for folks in general, um, I, I hope they get some sense of a foundation and we can start getting some consistent language. Um, I, you know, like, and, and one other thing, just because we're, we prepared for it around that collaboration question, I hope eCampus can perhaps start thinking through how they can support us having stronger collaborations through more time to build projects, because I think that's a, a complication. I, I think people did a lot of great work, but the timelines we're working on for having collaborations are difficult to have really good quality collaborations because time moves so fast. But yeah, I'd like to see us get some consistency around what we mean by high flex, how we support high flex, and how we engage with faculty around engaging with high flex and their students. Great. Thanks, Joe. Kathleen, how about you? What do you hope folks get? I'm just viewing this as a starting point and not the be end and end all. So what other supports at your institution, workshops or other, I know there's an online learning community that Brian Beattie set up around high flex, what else is out there where you can kind of gather additional information and then, you know, make small changes in the moment um, to try to test out some of the high flex principles. Great, thanks Kathleen. Krista, how are you? Uh, what I really enjoyed about this, this resource is that yes, it's about high flex, but it's also just about great teaching practices. So what I hope that anybody gets out of this um, is just from start to finish from the course development to you evaluating the effectiveness of your teaching and of your practice, that you're coming away with some tangible strategies and examples that you can apply right away in whatever modality you're teaching. Um, you know, high flex, great, but even if you're teaching a flex or asynchronous or in person or virtual, um, there are a ton of strategies that you can use. So it, what I hope is just great pedagogy. Okay, great. In well, the interest of keeping eCampus Ontario on time, I invite folks to put any further thought, final thoughts about what they hope folks get out of it or information around how uh, this collaboration was for you as, as part of the team into the chat and share with the participants. Um, I appreciate your time so much and thank you to eCampus for inviting us today. Thank you uh, very much to all of our panelists for our first presentation. It's very informative. Thank you. Uh, so that takes us to the second half of our hour here together, uh, looking at our second uh, presentation titled Expanding Institutional Accessibility, Niagara Col College's Accessibility Hub. Our presenters are Natasha Hannon, she, her, Jim McEwen, he, him, and Whit Ross, they, them. Uh, I would invite uh, our panelists to come forward and turn on their cameras. And uh, I know they'll be sharing a presentation here on the screen. Thanks very much, Don. We're in a similar situation to our colleagues before. My video is disabled. <laughs> okay, if I could ask my colleagues uh, in the green room to uh, enable those functions, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, just reminding uh, everyone in attendance today as uh, uh, the folks uh, uh, introduce their presentation to us. Please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A and uh, we will address them uh, at the appropriate time. Okay, so over to you. All right, wonderful. Uh, I will start, I'm slide sharing. You can't see me yet um, because I think it's better that I begin the presentation than fiddle with my camera, but my name is Natasha Hannon. Um, I am the Director of Teaching and Learning Innovation at Niagara College, uh, and I am joined by two of my colleagues, and I'll invite them to introduce themselves quickly here. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Ross. I'm Jim McEwen. Thanks both. And together with um, 
Wit and Jim and a group of well over 20 college staff, students and alumni, we developed the Niagara College Accessibility Hub. Um, this is a resource that we hope will help our organization, but also staff and educators across the post-secondary landscape to implement accessibility first approaches in their communications, events, course materials, and their learning experiences. Um, before moving on, I do want to acknowledge that most of our team lives and works on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. Uh, this is territory covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. So what is the Accessibility Hub? Um, this is a website with over 55 articles, checklists, videos, and other resources that are really intended to simplify and support the creation of accessible communications and content within post-secondary institutions. These were developed by staff and faculty and educational developers in Niagara College for staff, faculty, and educators at Niagara College. And so, you know, really these were created in as simple, straightforward um, a way as possible to make them as usable for folks who work in the environments that many of us do. That link there is to the hub before. I'm sure that one of my colleagues will also put it in the chat. We will take some time to do a bit of a tour of the hub. So Wit will be here later to give you a sense of what the hub looks like. In terms of how the hub came into existence, uh, this was truly a collaborative effort. Uh, so we had over 30 staff, students, and recent alumni uh, from various areas of our college. So our Center for Academic Excellence, our Health, Wellness, and Accessibility team, as well as our marketing and communications groups all came together uh, to create the final result that you'll see in just a second. The idea, the seed actually came from our webmaster, Courtney Thagard, in very late 2020. And part of the reason that Courtney brought this forward is because as webmaster, um, you know, she's globally responsible for the websites at our college. And she noticed that many staff across the organization were struggling to understand their accountabilities with respect to accessibility and also to produce accessible content. Um, you know, we have a lot of ownership at our institution over our individual web presences. And so we're adding materials, documents, and many times those weren't meeting our requirements uh, or showing best practices around accessibility. And so Courtney really wanted to see whether a number of us could come together to build out some supports for folks across our campus. And so um, the Accessibility Hub was actually a small part of a uh, digital capacity grant that we received from eCampus Ontario in early 2021, and we're very grateful for that support. Um, and then we worked through that period, among other projects, to complete the hub in early 2022 uh, with a release internally to our community over the last couple of weeks and also, um, you know, communications to many of our professional networks just over the last week or so. One of the main messages we're trying to share at our own campus is around who should use the hub. Um, because some of the key staff who coordinated this initiative reside in the Center for Academic Excellence, sometimes there's a perception at our college that when resources emerge from that uh, location, it's primarily for faculty. And one of the messages we've been trying to share consistently is that the Accessibility Hub is not only for faculty. Anyone who writes an email, creates a social media post, you know, books a meeting, uh, creates a PowerPoint presentation, which is basically all of our uh, staff, any of those folks need to be aware um, of the approaches that can enhance the accessibility of um, their communications and their activities. So we're really encouraging this to be taken up by our entire organization and also hopefully by you know, those of you, everything we've created is completely open. Um, and so we are hoping that others at other organizations will also be able to make use of these materials. There are six 
main categories that WIT will share with you in just a second. Uh, those resource categories on the hub include accessible foundations, um, document accessibility, website accessibility, accessible communications and events, video accessibility, and then accessible academic delivery. And of course, I'm sure that I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but the message that we're trying to share within our own organization is that, you know, the accessibility hub is, is important for a variety of reasons. Being an educational institution, right, our thoughts primarily go immediately to students. And certainly there are students who face numerous barriers as they navigate their way through post-secondary institutions and, you know, applying more accessible practices can certainly hit, uh, assist in decreasing those barriers. But I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that our colleagues at our institutions have accessibility needs as well. And sometimes those accessibility needs are invisible. And I think it's imperative that we consider uh, more frequently um, those staff uh, when we plan and host events or develop communications. Of course, the other piece of this is also compliance and certainly with the post-secondary um, AOTA working group coming forward with their final set of recommendations over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there are clearly going to be, you know, more significant um, requirements upon us related to accessibility. So that's definitely another consideration. And with that, uh, I will hand things over to my colleague Wit, who's going to take us on a bit of a tour uh, of the accessibility hub itself. Awesome. Thanks, Natasha. Um, and I just answered a question uh, in the chat that came in. To, and I was going to start off with this by saying that this is uh, the website and um, it is built on the newest version of the WordPress content management system, the Gutenberg block editor. Um, that is as far as my technical knowledge of the website goes. Um, this was built by two of our fantastic webmasters and developers at Niagara College, Courtney Thaggard and Sarah Lacan. So when you arrive at the accessibility hub, um, this is our landing page, and um, let me just make sure I'm missing the chat. And so the Accessibility Hub um, is, oh, sorry, the link just put out for me. There we go. Um, so our Accessibility homepage is here. Um, we, we wanted it to be an in integrated site that also showed um, just how important of a resource it was for our institution. So, you know, we also have service disruptions that are updated daily that feed through um, the Accessibility Hub homepage. So staff and students and faculty are aware of disruptions that are taking place on campus. Um, we have a, a pointing to our resources and training library, which is I think the most important part of the site. And I'll take you there in just one second. And then we also have a video library, which I'll showcase briefly in a second. Um, and so if we go up here to our resources and training articles, this is where Natasha mentioned our six categories um, that we tried to sort of cover as robust and broad of topics as possible with the acknowledgement that, um, you know, these categories and the articles and resources themselves, we don't want these to be static. Um, certainly we're hoping to add to them and expand to them because um, we know that we're missing things, right? Um, this was what we were able to accomplish in, um, a, you know, a very tight timeline um, and are always looking to continuously improve our accessibility as an institution. Um, one of the areas that I want to draw your attention to is, some, is a category that we're calling accessible foundations. Um, and this was really driven by a need within our own institution, but I think it also uh, you know, exists in larger sort of uh, pockets of higher education within Ontario, which is folks not really understanding why accessibility is so important. Um, not understanding disability perspectives and this idea of disability justice. And so certainly within our own institution, we often come up against instances where folks, um, once they take some time to learn why, hey, you need to make sure your email is accessible and here's why, then they're a little more motivated to uh, actually take the time to ensure that their materials are accessible. So um, we consider this sort of not only a very important edifying category, but the sort of incentive piece where this is why it matters, folks. Um, and we were really wanted to fight against some of the tension that emerges when we're talking about accessibility, where it's simply just about compliance, right? We wanted to move beyond 
compliance and say this is about equity. And if we're going to try to claim that we're truly an inclusive institution, then well, we need to get better at accessibility. And here's why. So that's the one category, and we have conversations and resources talking about why accessibility matters, ableism and disableism within teaching and learning context, and also just ableism and disableism in a larger context that we think are very important. Um, we also have, this is our largest category, it is accessible academic delivery. Um, all of these resources, as Natasha mentioned, apply to faculty, staff, and also some students. We know have already started to pay attention to this because there, there are um, instances where students are gonna be creating presentations as well. So we're encouraging faculty to also leverage this as an opportunity uh, to share resources with their students as they're creating their own uh, course material as well. Um, you can see that we have a very long list of topics for the academic accessible delivery. And it, um, the sort of the process behind this is we sort of sat down, um, you know, there was a working group of us and we just wanted to think through what do educators need to know? Um, and a lot of time this was informed by what are we not doing well? What can we do better at? Um, and then we would work from there. And certainly we listened to a lot of uh, staff within the, our accessibility services office who shared with us a lot of the stories from disabled students who were encountering inaccessible uh, learning experiences. And of course, that was vastly exasperated uh, with the onset of remote teaching in March 2020. And so that was sort of the impetus and approach that we took for developing some of these resources is where do we need immediate attention right now and how can we better support our faculty and staff to support students with more accessible learning experiences. Um, we also wanted to highlight people who um, benefit from accessibility, right? Um, and this was that idea about going beyond compliance. Um, we really wanted to try to have like a, a humanizing principle to our accessibility hub. And we wanted to talk to students who benefit from accessibility and require it uh, for their learning. So we started creating um, our lived experiences, student stories. Um, we were only able to complete a few and we're hoping to add more again, because we think that sometimes our faculty and staff are motivated when they hear human stories about why accessibility is important. Um, we also have some faculty members who spoke to how they have incorporated best practices for accessibility in their course to serve as exemplars. And then our lovely assistive technologist, Jim McEwen, who I'm about to turn it over to, uh, has created a lot of great videos about of how to videos and resources. Um, one of my particular favorites is this one. Um, I don't know about you, but at our institution, we find a, a lot of faculty don't always know what resources or tools students are using to access their learning. And so Jim has a great three minute video that just shows you the basics of OneNote and how students are using it, especially to help increase accessibility in their courses. Um, the last thing that I will draw your attention to before I turn it over to Jim is that we really wanted to ensure that we were keeping this as an open conversation with our learning community. Um, we wanted to ensure that we had multiple feedback mechanisms built into the site because um, we know that there's always going to be more opportunities for improvement and expansion when it comes to accessibility, especially in post-secondary. So we do have a feedback form that folks can complete to tell us what they think about the hub and it's sent directly to an email. So far, we've only had like tech companies trying to sell us stuff for accessibility, um, but we are hopeful to start getting some more genuine feedback. And then but I'm gonna turn it over to Jim in just one second. So I'll go to document accessibility, but um, you'll see that at the bottom of every page, we have it, is this page useful? Um, they click on it and direct feedback about the specific resource is delivered directly to our emails and we're able to then um, make adjustments on the fly as needed. That in a nutshell is sort of a brief navigation. And Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you just to speak to some of the document accessibility content that you created. Great, uh, good job, Wit. Thank you very much. May I share my screen? So um, my name's Jim and I'm the uh, adaptive technology specialist at the college and I've been doing it for 20 years. And so I've uh, seen a lot of um, accessibility challenges as well as uh, things to celebrate about accessibility. 
And um, when um, I was writing the documentation on uh, accessible uh, creation of documents, um, I wanted to make it a little different than you would usually find. So what happens is that uh, companies like Microsoft and Adobe create fantastic articles, um, how to do things. Um, the challenge is that sometimes it's a little pedantic. And so uh, at the bottom of each article, I, we have the, um, the further resources. And so it allows us to, my apologies, wrong article. Um, this bar is in my way, there we go. It allows us to um, have other resources that you can access. So um, it's a long article. <laughs> um, so here we have the um, articles from WebAIM and Microsoft and, and other, other companies that make those uh, really professional, um, up-to-date articles. However, the ones that we've created um, are really um, different in that they're based on the person and the usability of the software or the, the documents and the lived experience on creating um, accessibility. So uh, this is the PowerPoint document. So in the PowerPoint document, we even have um, information about how to turn on the subtitles, create um, live presentations, as well as the more typical descriptive information. Um, and it allows people to be able to use it in a way that um, gives them a little more flexibility. For example, in the... Um, In the article about the accessibility checker, you can access the accessibility checker in several ways. So we actually have them all. And when you get there, it actually tells you how to navigate it. Even the little uh, extra areas that pop up that are often overlooked that just make using the system easier and um, more uh, inviting to use. The article on uh, Microsoft Word actually shows about the process of applying a style or headings. Now, it's pretty simple to apply a style or a heading, but usually it comes up in a way that you don't want it to come up. So um, I, in the document, we take a look at how to make those styles the way that you would want them to. So here we have, um, customizing styles. So we talk about actually making it from something you already have instead of getting big blue letters. If you have uh, an article that you've written and there's a font that you like, you've chosen the bold, you've done everything you want, you can just update it. And so those things are often the really usable pieces that get kind of slipped between the rocks. And um, so that's what we tried to bring up, not just in the document, portion, but in all of the uh, parts. Um, and we talk about things that may not even be in, um, in typical documentation. For example, in the PowerPoint documents, um, we talk about the idea that slide titles are important. So they might not state that in some documentation or some articles, about it, but we uh, we focus in on those things that really make the the tools usable for people, and it's really aimed at everyone, so that we can all kind of bring um, more accessibility into the house right from the get go, rather than um, fixing documents that have already been made. The hope is that we can have documents that are accessible from the get go. Um, Natasha, do you want to conclude? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jim. And I apologize that your uh, 
noted as as me. Um, but that is in fact Jim oh, McEwen. <laughs> and we have the incredible benefit of his depth of expertise in working with students. And I think what Jim shared is exactly that, that we were able because of Jim's um, experience to translate what is truly helpful for students into um, what we hope is very user-friendly documentation for the folks who create those materials. Again, as Jim noted, focused on the pieces that will make your life easier and hopefully allow you to take an accessibility first uh, approach as you design your content and your communications. Um, finally, we just wanted to wrap by letting you know that you know the hub doesn't only need to be used as a hub. We're exploring some different applications at our institution. So the content created for the hub has now, I think, enabled uh, us at the Center for Academic Excellence to quite quickly translate some of these into uh, webinars and presentations for our community. So we have turned a number of these into webinars. And again, we're not necessarily deep experts. Certainly, I say that for myself, Jim is, um, but I'm not. Uh, but there's enough here that I feel like we can, that I now can give people, you know, solid steps that can really help them to enhance some of their key course documents. So we're, we're flipping these into presentations. Um, as a manager, we're looking to bring some of these forward into our team meetings so that again, like it's just maybe one page, maybe we're going to invite folks to, to look at them ahead of our team meeting, but we can come together and talk about, hey, we create a lot of presentations. We send out posts on social media. How can we improve our own practices. So we think there are a number of ways that you might be able to leverage this and I'd love your ideas um, and welcome your questions. That's the end of our presentation. I know we have a few more minutes. Um, so if anyone has any questions or any thoughts on how you might leverage um, this resource, we'd love to hear it. Well, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, lots of wonderful uh, positive comments in the chat as well about uh, the, how comprehensive uh, this resource is. I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A. Oh, we just we do have one popping up just now. So uh, we have uh, the question is just curious. Does Niagara College have a college wide closed captioning strategy or does that fall on the creators of the videos? If any of the panelists want to offer. Yeah, it's a really great, great question, Peter. Um, I have often uh, looked at my colleagues at George Brown College who do have a comprehensive closed captioning strategy with a lot of envy. Uh, we do not. So currently closed captioning does fall on the creators of the videos. Thank you. Um, I just had I kind of a question I had and uh, as you were kind of going through and I'm wondering kind of looking from a management perspective and you mentioned how in your institution instructors are, are very much responsible for the creation of their own individual content and I'm wondering what are some of the biggest challenges in rolling out and making sure that you, folks are kind of going into the resources and actually using them in a previous life I've develop these kinds of things and you put some great stuff out there, but then you find out nobody's actually following through and actually getting in there and using them. How do you kind of ensure that that's happening? What are some of the best practices? Oh, Don, if I had that magic wand, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been in the same scenario. I'll say we've created a number of open resources over the last few years. Um, and, uh, and they perhaps have not been as well used as we had hoped. And sometimes they're better used by others in other organizations than in fact they are in our own. Um, I think we've learned some lessons from that. Uh, one of the lessons that I think we're hoping to learn with this particular resource um, is uh, we have engaged our executive early in the value of this resource and we've been given a couple of important platforms. One of them is with our college management team. Um, I think a lot of times those middle managers within the organization are really key to um, the execution and the application of some of these uh, resources. And so we are going to be able to engage with them. We also have the benefit of a new strat plan that just launched uh, last week where accessibility figures prominently. Um, so we think on the basis of that, but this particular resource uh, will be perhaps better used than some of our others. Well, thank you. 
Uh, I'm just seeing here, we have another question in the chat, noticing the French, uh, live French translation that was part of the, uh, was, was this part of the accessibility strategy of Niagara College, or was this an eCampus Ontario strategy? So uh, just uh, the French translation was uh, built into the eCampus delivery strategy for uh, the BLS open house. Um, and in terms of accessing those kinds of features, um, I would invite you to perhaps reach out to uh, uh, Paula to reach out to our comms team and they might be able to provide some uh, feedback in terms of how to access those kinds of resources. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm just seeing here, I don't see any other specific questions, um, but if any, any last minute uh, comments from the panel, a kind of a rapid fire, is there anything you'd like to leave us with as we uh, exit here today? No, other than our thanks for everyone's participation. And uh, yeah, we appreciate the platform and the funding from eCampus. Well, thank you uh, very much to, to both panels today for excellent presentations. And again, reiterating our thanks to the Ministry of Colleges and Universities uh, for the funding that made the VLS possible. Uh, it's just amazing to watch uh, this uh, amazing resource spread across the province and create so many open education opportunities here in Ontario's post-secondary sector. So thank you very much. And uh, we can give you back uh, two minutes of your day. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of the week.